My name is uh, Rami Ismail. I'm a game developer best known for my work at a game studio called Vlaambeer. We're the creators of games uh, with explosions. Uh, we made a game about collecting crates uh, with explosions. We made a game about flying airplane with explosions. We made a game about uh, being a mutant with explosions. And we made a game about fishing with explosions. Uh, besides that, I'm the creator of tools like Prescott, uh, which is the industry standard tool for Prescott development. I'm the organizer of GameDev.World, which is a online conference in eight different languages about game development. I help organize or helps organize the Indie Mega Booth. I'm a partner in Indie Fund, which funds independent game development. And I'm a lifelong member of the IGD8 International Game Developers Association. Um, in 2018, I was awarded with a, a big award. Um, I tend to have the slide here to explain that, but I, I don't think we have too much time to talk about all the other stuff I do. What I really wanted to talk about is how I got started, what code is, why code is important. I got started like this. This is the first thing I ever saw on a computer, uh, besides you know, like the, the boot up, uh, the BIOS boot up. Um, and it was DOS, and I didn't know what DOS was. Um, I just started typing words. I'm originally Dutch Egyptian, so I didn't know English, and I just got really fortunate that the English word help is the same word as help in Dutch. So um, I figured things out over time. Um, and because of that, I think, uh, and I think a lot of us might have sort of um, a practical idea with code and more of a philosophical idea with code. And I kind of want to talk about both of those a little bit. Um, but to explain that, I think I have to talk about how games are code and how games are not code. Um, and I want to make an argument for why games, despite being largely code, um, thinking of games as traditional code, as the way we get taught about code, as these uh, structures, is both harmful and helpful when you're in games. Before that, I want to I want to zoom out a little bit about what games are. For those of you who like video games, you might be very aware of what it is. For those of you who don't know video games, I'm going to do a really quick intro of what video, video games are and where video games got started. So bear with me for just a few minutes. So video games got started a very long time ago. Uh, they weren't called video games then. They were just called play. Uh, tens of thousands of years ago, humanity already was playing. And the people that played actually survived, um, were more likely to survive. People that would throw rocks at trees would be better at throwing spare, spares at animals. People that climb trees for fun would uh, be better at escaping hunters than the people who wouldn't. It is believed uh, pretty pretty commonly around the world at this point that playfulness evolved into humans and that our want to play, our willingness to play uh, is one of the most effective learning strategies and educational strategies that we have. It's why kids are very playful and sadly over time we kind of lose that ability as more responsible tasks fall upon us. I found a cheat code by becoming a game developer so now I don't have to, you know, grow up. Um, I'm Egyptian, so I have to put Senate in here. Uh, 3,000 years uh, ago, the Egyptians were playing board games. Play has always been part of humanity. And really, the the, the big breakthrough, the big moment um, for games was when, for video games at least, was when these devices got made, these computers. And really, the main thing that changed is that games went from being about the rules of people playing, the board, the, the pieces, the, 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 the objects that you interact with, to them being effectively a bunch of mathematicians trying to explain to a conduit that electricity should go through in a specific way, and that based on how the electricity flows through that conduit, on the screen, things would change, and that what's on the screen and how the electricity flows would be dependent on a input of some of some sort. And that was the start of video games. Um, the start of video games was a bit of a mess. Uh, it was mostly ma mathematicians. It was um, a bunch of uh, self-proclaimed nerds, uh, and. Um, you know, it's not like these were professionals. A lot of these people were just, you know, kids 
trying to do cool stuff with computers, hackers, people that didn't really know what they were doing, uh, but that just got really good at it. And I think the thing that I love about games programming early on is that it was full of stuff like this, where um, we didn't know what we were doing, but we found better ways of doing it. This is if the fast inver uh, fast inverse square root uh, calculation that was in uh, Doom, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you can see it on the third line there uh, in the code block. Um, and this works. It's a good approximation. Uh, why it works? Well, I mean, uh, because it works. Over years, uh, I think one of the one of the things actually to, to realize about game code that's really important is that it's a different beast, right? Games code is just a completely different thing from most other code. When you're writing most code, when you're writing an application, uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make sure that your application uses as little as possible from the computer, from the available hardware, to do as much as possible with the hardware that you're using. Games frequently work the other way around. You're trying to maximize the use of hardware and then trying to see what you can get out of that, right? Um, there's a few applications, mostly in rendering, that have that sort of requirement. But in general, in applications, you're trying to keep the load down. In games, you're trying to use as much as possible. It's meant that games have been sort of at the forefront of a lot of technological revolutions, stuff like crypto and, and space, uh, space flight. I use a lot of games-related uh, technology because we have to do things differently. Uh, we have to push for most out of a computer instead of the least out of a computer. It's just fascinating. What then happened was a little unexpected. The, the group of nerds from before, the mathematicians, accidentally created what might be the largest entertainment industry in the world. Uh, games now annually gross about $160 billion in revenue. As you can see, it started with just arcade. Then it was console, handheld, PC, mobile, VR. Uh, it keeps growing keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And game studios turn from small groups of people into giant teams of multidisciplinary people working across dozens of different industries from visual graphics, uh, from visual graphics, effects, audio, motion capture, acting, programming, um, honestly, all sorts of stuff, right? And because studios are now so big and because we make so much money, we got it together. Or we didn't. We just really didn't. We have no idea what we're doing. 90% of the time, game developers don't know what they're doing. Nobody knows what's up in the games industry. And we really try to. We really want to. But the reality is that most of the time, what we are doing is so complicated and so out there and so creative or unique that there isn't much of a structure to be told about, to, to talk about. Um, the best we get is that we got better at fixing small individual problems, that we got better at figuring out the, um, the specifics of, of what we're doing. So yeah, now we know how to profile and you know uh, we have specialized people that are really digging down into like the engine, the performance, the rendering. Those are really fun jobs, by the way. If you're that kind of person, go for it. The majority of programmers in games work on, um, Making th making the game work, making the creative part of the game work. Um, I'm seeing somebody uh, asking if uh, about the stream quality. None of the text on the screen so far has been particularly important. Um, I'm really bad at words, so don't don't worry about the words on the screen. Uh, if there's any slide unclear, let me know. This is a profiler for League of Legends. Um, Anyway, by and large, game programming, games programming is a mess. Um, and the problem is, I think, that most code is written to solve a problem. We're problem solvers. Yes, we're technicians, we're engineers, uh, we're coders. But at heart, what we are really is problem solvers. We have a specific problem that we need a solution for, and we write code. As we write that code, we iterate over that code uh, to make it better, to improve it, and then we reach the solution. Games programming is more like this, where we iterate on what the problem is because we don't have a problem yet. What we're doing is completely optional. We're not solving a need. We're not doing anything. We're, we're iterating. We decided that we wanted a game in which a car can drive around. 
Then we iterate over how we're going to solve that. And then we iterate over the solution and the problem at the same time at once, right? Games programming doesn't adhere to clear, clear problem solution schemes because we don't know what we're making. Usually, as we're making games, stuff changes. And part of that is because games are magic. I don't mean magic magic. I don't mean like card magic. What I mean is that this is the, the model that we get taught in the games industry for human-computer interaction, right? Uh, I'm not sure if that's a, a field that you study, uh, but um, in case you haven't, the basic idea is that a user has a mental model of what they're expected to do. Then they press a button based on what their expectations are. The input is processed by the black box, uh, which is the program. And then the black box gives feedback, which then updates the mental model. The easiest way to explain this really is if you boot up a video game, if you play video games, if you boot up a video game, usually what starts uh, is the publisher logo. You see the logo of the people that made the game. Most players will then try and press spacebar to skip that logo and go to the main menu. So that's the input. The black box processes that. If it is indeed correct that you can skip, the feedback then snaps from showing the logo to showing the menu, right? That updates the mental model. The player now knows, OK, I can press spacebar. Next time they boot up the game, they'll try and do the same. If spacebar doesn't work, they might try escape. If that doesn't work, they might go grab a drink until the video game boots up, right? So this is happening continuously in games. But the trick, the, the thing that that means is that the reality of games isn't actually in that black box. The code doesn't matter that much. All that matters is that the code does what it needs to do, and that the code tricks people into believing things, believing that this is a metro in um, in a station and that it will move from A to B, that it drives along the rail, that it works. But the reality is that this is how this metro works. It's a hat on a playable character that is coded with movement. Uh, and they just changed the head into a hat and then stopped the head from moving because that was easier than coding a completely separate system for a metro, right? Um, and sometimes really funny stuff happens in games that we as programmers just didn't predict, like World of Warcraft accidentally released a pandemic in the game because a piece of code that men, was meant to stay in one place got out and created a pandemic that was so realistic in the way it spread that it was studied and probably applied to our current life situation to try and figure out how to deal with pandemics. Um, there are lots of stories about this. One of my favorite is about a team of programmers that was asked to solve a really big engine problem they ran into. And it's not this game, by the way. I just put this image here because it's relevant. A lot of these stories are NDA, so I can't tell you who it was or you know whatever. Um, they were asked to solve a big problem. Right before ship, they had to update the physics engine of their game, the physics engine which keeps track of all the physical interactions in the game. And it worked everywhere except for in one level where all the items started floating above the ground about three or four centimeters. And that wouldn't be a problem except for after the level started, this spectacular helicopter crash, the player would wake up and then as soon as the level loaded in, every object in that level would fall, hit the ground, which was a lot of physics calculations, and then play the sound for hitting the ground, which meant the audio engine could completely overload it, couldn't keep up and made what could best be described as a fart sound uh, while the game tried to catch up for a good like seven to 10 seconds, um, which was bad. And they were asked to solve that problem. The thing, the funny thing about it is that um, they tried everything. They tried moving the level up. They tried writing scripts that move the items down. Whatever they did, it caused more problems. Until eventually, one of the programmers went to a designer and said, OK, I have an idea on how to solve this. The way they solved it is after the helicopter crash, they cut to black and play a really loud beep on a separate audio thread. As the audio engine and the game processes the falling items, and because the audio engine is muted, you don't hear it, then as soon as that's over, the beep fades out and the game fades in. They never fixed the problem. They just hit it because it's magic. The only thing that matters is the mental model. It doesn't matter whether it's actually true, whether it's right. All that matters is whether the player believes it. 
This is how we code in video games. And this is true for everything. You can try and balance your game with numbers. You can try and balance your game with, uh, with code, with logic. But the reality is all that matters is that it feels true. So if you have to balance weapons in a video game, for example, if you're coding weapon balance, if you're trying to figure out the right numbers, sometimes you can balance weapons just by sound. There's a famous multiplayer game where one of the weapons was underperforming, and they just gave it a better sound. People started using it more, numbers went up. Um, and in games, we frequently cheat. Like, this is a mirror from the game Deus Ex. It's not actually a mirror. You're looking into another room behind this wall where there's a copy of the player character moving inverted to what the player is doing. So they're just taking the orientation and the position in that room. They flipped it around. That's how they did mirrors. Reflection was way too expensive to do. Um, so why would you? Why would you if you can solve it this way, right? It's why the gun is in different positions. It's just a copy of the player character. And sometimes code does incredible things. Like uh, if you were making a vehicle combat game and you might want to test your physics, right? And you might decide that you need to add a physics object to the space. And you might decide that the best physics object to test with might be a ball. And if you might think that, and that might be your solution, you might end up making Rocket League, which is probably the one of the most popular games of the last few years. They added a ball to test some stuff, liked rolling around with the ball, and turned it into the video game. And I love that for many games, you can tell that it is a programmer's game. Right, some games are clearly artists' games. Some games are clearly programmers' game. No Man's Sky, uh, by Hello Games, is so clearly a programmers' game. It's entirely built about procedural generation, numbers, math, um, and you get these really unique, different games when programmers are in charge of the game. When programmers are not in charge of games, you get different types of games, also unique, also interesting. Uh, but in both positions, as a programmer, there's so much to understand about what games actually are and what games are not, right? So what is code then? What is code in games? Because code in reality, right, in application development is a problem solving tool, is a way to make things work. In games, I think code is an expressive art and a tool at the same time. It's both at the same time, right? It is our potential and it is our constraints. When we start, programming, we have nothing. This is one of my favorite projects in years. This is called Nothing by Pippin Barr. And what Pippin did is he took every major games engine, booted up the default project, removed any, uh, any object that was there, and then exported just that. Uh, he built that as executable. So you can build the default executable for every game engine in this project. And it made me really happy because it really reminded me that this is what game development is, that this is what games programming is, is we are the glue to make everything else work. So then if games are code meant to do not code, right? If games are not code expressed through code, then a lot of people ask me, okay, but then Rami, I'm a programmer, right? Like I, I grew up as a programmer. What are the important skills to learn? What are the important things to know if I want to go into the games industry? If I want to be a game developer, what should I know? And the reality is that none of those things have to do with code. Yes, you should be a good programmer, of course. And yes, you should be a problem-solving programmer. You should be a programmer that understands the difference between this code needs to perform at its very best. We're trying to get milliseconds off of things, right? And this code just needs to work. We need the player to believe it. Understanding that difference is critical. The other thing that's critical to understand is that in game development, we are working across so many disciplines, so many different types of thinking, so many different types of wording things, that just being a good programmer isn't going to be good enough. If you are not a good team player, if you are not a good communicator, you will never be a good enough programmer for video games. Because the reality is we can find millions of good programmers around the world. What we can't find is programmers that understand how to communicate with an artist, programmers that understand how to talk to a designer, programmers that understand where to be serious about their code quality. Well, you should always be serious about your code quality, but you, you know what I mean. 
um, where to be serious about the like everything about their code and where to make sure that the code just works, right? The biggest challenge that programmers face when they go into the games industry is not being able to communicate across discipline lines. And this is a skill that I want to make sure that everybody that wants to get into games understands that talking, communicating, explaining your code, not just in comments, you get taught that, right? You're taught how to explain your code to coders. How do you explain your code to non-coders? Are you the kind of developer that when somebody asks how something works, they go, don't worry about it, it works? Or are you the kind of person that can sit down and then go like, well, okay, you know, for art, it's important that you understand that this is how the shader works. So if you're gonna export, you probably wanna look into that, right? So the, um, the other thing I wanna make sure you understand, and this is a personal thing for me, is I burned out once in the games industry and it was the scariest thing that happened in my life. The reason I burned out is because I overworked myself. And as an independent developer, that was incredibly easy. It was so easy to overwork yourself because I care. I love video games. I've been wanting to make video games since that A prompt at the start of the of this entire talk. That's what that was when I was six years old. I've been trying to be a game developer since I was six years old, and I overworked myself in the first three years of doing it, and I burned myself out. And the scariest thing that happened in my career was booting up my computer and staring at a cursor, just a blinking cursor on the screen, and getting a headache unlike anything I've uh, I've felt before. It was like my head was being split in two every time that cursor blinked. And I was young, I was 22, 21, 21, 22 years old. I was young, I was, I was strong, I was healthy. I'm now 32, I'm tired and grumpy. Uh, it's, it happens, don't worry about it. Um, I was 22. I did, not, I did not believe you could be defeated that way. But I was defeated that way, and I almost left the games industry. I always le almost left this career. I almost quit the company. The company almost went out of business. When you work in the games industry, please take care of yourself, because the reality is the companies usually don't. The games industry is a brutal industry, and we're fighting this fight against crunch, against overwork, against bad labor conditions. But what is important is that as a programmer, you take care of yourself. Take rest, sleep, rest, like make sure that you're recovered. This is one of the most complicated jobs in the world mentally, right? We're thinking about our job is training a piece of silicon to have electricity go through it in such a way that the good thing happens when the player does the right button thing. Like programming is nonsense. We took the weirdest job in the world. And it's abstraction, it's logic, it's mental exercise. It is not an easy job, even if you love it. If you overwork yourself, you're gonna end up in that strange situation where the company ends up with everything and the people end up with burnout, right? So the two things, well, the three things, the three things to remember. The first one, in games code, the purpose isn't always to write the best code. It is to write code that works and that does what it needs. So if we're prototyping, I don't care about your code quality. If we're shipping, I care about your code quality, right? The second thing is to be a team player. Learn to communicate with other things. Learn to draw a little. Learn to talk about music. Learn to not be embarrassed to, to talk to your audio designer and then go, no, no, the explosion, it's like the, the sound, I don't want it to be like the, the I want it to be like, right? Like, don't be embarrassed to do that. Like, just accept that that's the easiest way to communicate about certain things, is to just do bad versions of it. That's why you work with those other people. The final one, take care of yourself. Please take care of yourself. Please take care of your rest. Please make sure you stay healthy. I thought I was invincible. I almost didn't make it. Uh, I almost didn't stay in this industry. I don't know what else I would do in my life. This is the only thing that I'm good at. I'm a programmer. I'm a games programmer. I'm a games designer. And I almost wasn't. So what is code? Well, code is both art and potential. It is the way we glue things together. It's how programmers can be a critical force in game development. But ultimately, it's whatever you want it to be. And don't let anybody tell you anything else.